welcome to this week's episode of Liberty Chat, brought to you by the Liberal Democrats. Welcome everyone to another edition of Liberty Chat, our weekly roundup of all things liberty from across the country and occasionally international as well. As you may see, we have a very reduced panel tonight. We have Mr. John Ruddock here tonight. Thank you for joining us on Australia Day. Hi, John. Good evening, Kirsty. Good evening. Absolutely happy Australia Day. Happy Australia Day to you. And as viewers of Liberty Chat may realise, we don't have David Limbrick or Campbell Newman here today. They're both have been at citizenship ceremonies and events in Brisbane and Melbourne. So um, that's been great for them. But so, you know, we're here, the stalwarts carrying the torch, because of course we do have a great episode tonight with of course our interview with Spike Cohen from the US Libertarian Party. We've also got uh, another little guest who will be a bit of a surprise, we'll tell you about later. And of course, we are playing our episode two of the Freedom Manifesto little policy videos. But John, firstly, what have you been up to this week and what have you got coming up? Okay, well, look, I have noticed in, in the last week or so, there has been a real uptick in interest from people who want to be candidates in New South Wales, which is encouraging because, you know, we are into the final stretch here. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, gearing up for a, you know, a pretty important federal election for the country and for the party. So uh, now at nine o'clock this Saturday, we've got a we've got Victor Tay's campaign launch, which you can find details on on his Facebook. Now, he's our candidate for wherever. Yep. Last Saturday at the Freedom March, which we had in Sydney, which was at, at Strathfield. Uh, Victor Tay turned up with the Victor Tay army. OK, so he had a, he had about a dozen people there, all with Victor Tay T-shirts and a lot of enthusiasm. So really looking forward to Saturday. Should be having a good candidate for Wentworth announced in the next day or two, so stay tuned for that. Excellent. Now we've got our uh, <clears throat> our little uh, little High Court matter on the fifteenth of February. <laughs> and, um, now the day after that, win, lose or draw, uh, on the sixteenth of February, we've got our big uh, um, uh, campaign launch for the Riverina. Yep, so that uh, the Riverina Rebellion in Wagga. Yes, yes, and that that is looking good with uh, the fabulous Dean McRae. Yep, I think John Larter is, is going to be there. Ross Cameron. Watching, Ross Cameron, absolutely, yes. And uh, I think uh, Tim Quilty might be popping over the border. Yes, yes, he is. And you might be there, Kirsty. is that I right? I will definitely be there. Rob McCarthy and I will be doing a road trip. We're going to Canberra first and then Wagga. Um, right. Mostly just because we want to get out of Melbourne, to be honest. I see. Okay. <laughs> now, tomorrow night at 6.30 or 6, or 6 o'clock for 6.30, just in case people happen to be particularly interested in Australian history, I am doing a book launch uh, for, for William Coleman at the home building at Sydney University. So the public is invited. He has written an extraordinary book about the Federation period, which I hope to do a blistery history on in oh. the near future. So that Great. is, that is a, uh, something I'm very much looking forward to. Oh, that's fantastic. That sounds really interesting as well. Yes. Um, righto. Well, we have, as I said before, we do have a special secret little guest we've popped in today. And she's come all the way from WA. We welcome Ms. Kate Fantanelle. Hi, Kate. Hello. I finally found a channel that we could broadcast out of McGowan's Ham at Kimmington. So thank you for having us. I'm jealous of you talking about traveling across borders because that right has been taken away from us indefinitely. So it's the libertarians' time to take back WA. Well, yeah, yeah. many of our longer term members would be very familiar with the wonderful Kate. Kate was a staffer of David Linehelm when he was a senator, and then she also worked with Aaron Stonehouse in Perth as well. So she's been around the party a long time, and Kate's been charged with basically revitalising our WA team because, uh, you know, that last election was a real doozy for everyone, and we did lose Aaron, of course. Um, but Kate, you've also got some very interesting and special news for us. So I have the honour of being endorsed as the lead Senate candidate for the Liberal Democrats in Western Australia. Brilliant. We've got a new flag. We flew it on the weekend <laughs> at the Freedom Rally. For those of you not familiar, this is the Black Swan, which is the flag of Western Australia. We've um, hijacked it. It's called the Glad Swan flag. For those <laughs> and look, the, the turnout on Saturday was fantastic. Like the tide really is turning over here. Mm. People are fed up with McGowan. He's taken away our right to travel for nearly two years now. He's mandated 75% of the workforce for the vaccine, including the booster shot. He's treated our FIFO and mining industry like slaves, to be frank. Yes. And the, the tide is turning. So I think 
even with the borders closing, people have really had enough. Mm. Well, it's great that to have you on board. And have you got other, is there events coming up, like a, a branch meetings happening in WA? What's happening over there, Kate? So this Saturday, we're having our soft campaign launch, two o'clock at 43 below. Mm -hmm. Myself and my number two candidate, Dr. Peter McLaughlin, who's fantastic, a doctor, yep. retired doctor. He also ran in the state election last year for us. So yep. it's Peter and I trying to turn the tide against McGowan and represent oh, yeah. him because we really need someone to stand up to him. We do not have an opposition here in WA. They were wiped out at the state election. We need to send someone to Canberra to hold this tyrant to account. Mm, that's right. What, what, what's been happening with the size of the freedom marches in Perth over the last, say, the last six months? Have they, I'm guessing they've been going up because the, the sort of the restrictions get more intense. Is that, is that what has been happening? That's correct, John. So on the weekend, even though it was 41 degrees, there was still a massive turnout. Um, there's another one on the 5th of February, which is the date that we were meant to open. McGowan has said, I don't know when I'm going to open, sorry, which is just <laughs> disgraceful for businesses as well. People who haven't been able to see family or friends, mm -hmm. our international people that live here. I'm actually from South Australia. I can't go home either. So there is the movement of, of people who have are just fed up. They want their freedom back. They've got, they've had one, two, three injections now. They've checked in, they've done the QR codes, and, and he's not rewarding them for that. So mm. it's definitely the momentum is growing and the Liberal Democrats are really, it's really our time to shine. That's brilliant. Well, there's a lot of comments in the chat box here for you as well. A lot of people saying congratulations. Nadia is also asking, is anyone filming the protest in WA? Like, like obviously in Melbourne, we've got Rukshan and Tofa and then uh, Sydney has Aussie Cossack. Is there any like YouTuber that's getting out there in WA? So we did have someone, a volunteer film for us. If you check out our Facebook page, of Liberal Democrats WA, there is a video. You can see how big the march was. We've also put up some photos as well. And we'll, we've got a campaign committee now. If you're interested in getting involved, please come to our event on Saturday. Now is the time to regain our freedom. So we're back. <laughs> and of course, if anyone wants any of that information, you can either get onto our website, you can email at contact at ldp.org.au, or you can email kate at kate.fantanel at ldp.org.au. And Kate, maybe put her, uh, you might put your email address in the chat box if people want information directly about what's coming up with your campaign. Well, and also, I guess this is so new in terms of your announcement, you haven't got your social media stuff set up. This is all very brand new. This was actually an exclusive tonight on Liberty Chat. So it's thank you. to 100, that. just yes. the way I like it. That's how it was in Lionhelm's office and Stonehouse's office. So I'm here and I'm ready to try and help save WA because we need we need a freedom fighter. We love here. it. We love it. A, Thanks so much for putting your hand up. Do you have a Twitter account, Kate? I do. Um, Lady Liberty W-A-U-S. I'll put it in the chat box. Yeah, okay. put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, thanks again for joining us tonight, Kate. And Thank you. Everyone, and Kate chat. will be in the chat box to answer any other questions and to say hi as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Right, Kate. Well, because we do have the Spike interview, we are going to launch straight into John's blistery history tonight. <laughs> uh, John, what have you got for us tonight? Okay, well, it's Australia Day, and uh, I wanted to talk about uh, what happened in Australia prior to 1788. So that is Aboriginal history with particular, uh, look, there's this magnificent insight into Aboriginal life before colonisation, mm. which was a book written by William Buckley. Now, William Buckley was, so not to be confused with the famous William F. Buckley, who was sort <laughs> of the, okay, but it is the, minus the F, it's the same spelling. William Buckley was, uh, here he is, he was a very tall, this, he, this was a very tall guy. He uh, was Englishman, fought in a pretty poor guy, fought in the Napoleonic Wars, got accused of a pretty minor crime, which he maintained for the rest of his life that he didn't actually commit. And he got sent to being a, he was dispatched to be a convict to Australia. Hmm. Now, this was 1803. Uh, so the, the Sydney Cove has been going for sort of 15, 16 years. They had discovered this magnificent harbour or bay called what we know as Port Phillip Bay. And they thought, well, that would be a great location for another convict colony. So they sent out two boats uh, full of convicts to Port Phillip Bay. 
and Buckley was one of those convicts, uh, were the first to arrive there. Now, then what happened is, uh, and I think that's sort of down sort of Sorrento, where Sorrento is now in Port Phillip Bay. Okay. And things weren't going very well after a couple of weeks. The British said, look, there's not much food here. There's not much water. So they all decided to go down to, to pack up, to, to uh, abandon the Port Phillip Bay uh, colony and to go down to Hobart, where they established a, a, a convict settlement. And that's what they did. Now, when the, when the convicts heard that they were going to take off to uh, Hobart, Four of them just bolted into the woods. One of them got shot and they thought that they were going to get to Sydney. And one of them was William Buckley. And those three convicts who were on the loose in the Australian bush, and then the British uh, soldiers sort of gave up finding them, they then separated. William Buckley is walking along, uh, I think a couple of weeks later, you know, he's by himself, he's in you know, a pretty rugged bushland and he finds this walking stick and he's walking along with his walking stick that he runs into to a group of Aborigines. These mm -hmm. Aborigines are convinced that he's actually, because he's so big and he's got this walking stick that he's a returned spirit of, of one of their elders who had died. Wow. So they revered him. And they really adopted him into the tribe and they looked after him and they really sort of uh, liked him. He had a very peaceful nature about him. Now he, Kirsty, he spent 32 years living with the, the, the Aboriginal tribes around Melbourne. That's amazing. Now, it is. Now, what we, the Aborigines were here for about 60,000 years, or had been here for about 60,000 years, much longer than, that, than the Native Americans have been in, in the Americas or anything like that. And, and they, uh, we don't, the truth is we don't know that much about them, okay, because they, they, did, they didn't have writing. They didn't really leave monuments. They left a few cave paintings and so forth. William Buckley... Uh, wrote a book about his time, 32 years. I mean, think about what we, I mean, this is going, if it was, you know, back, back to the 1990s for us. And after what, what he, and he, look, he describes a society, which I think is probably pretty typical for uh, all pre-agricultural societies, where there was a lot of intertribal conflict. There was a, usually about, uh, uh, young women fighting over who was going to marry who and etc. Mm, mm. uh, but but a lot of the time they, they seem to have had a lot of fun and everything. And anyway, after 32 years, and he, he married twice, almost certainly had a child. Uh, and in, in, the, uh, in, in the chat box, I think we're going to put up a, the PDF for his book. What happened was when, when, they, when the British again tried to kick off the Melbourne colony, William Buckley simply just walked in shortly after they arrived. I think it was John Batman. He said, look, here I am. He could still speak a bit of English. They were, And I think we've got a photo of what he looked like when he, he walked into the uh, settlement there. And he said, look, you know, look, I'm, a, I'm an escaped convict. He thought he would get in trouble. Very quickly, he became this celebrity in Australia and around the, and, and in the English-speaking world. There he is, yes. And the English were very, very nice to him. And they said, look, well, we want to know, what can you te teach us about how we can get along well with the Aborigines? And, uh, and he sort of then, Buckley then returned to uh, English life and sort of became the ambassador uh, or the goodwill person between the Aborigines and the English. Wow. And he then wrote this book. Now, this book is um, uh, a very short book, took you about two or three hours. Mm -hmm. Very interesting book. I believe it is the greatest insight into what life was like on this continent uh, prior to 1788. And, you know, it's really fascinating stuff. So I would you know, encourage people to read it. After well, the federal that, sound, that sounds a bit sacrilegious because, of course, we all know Dark Emu is the book that we're supposed to oh, read. Yes. Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's a little, bit of, a little bit of disagreement here between Dark Emu and William Buckley's account. But yes. I think I know which side I'm on. Uh, I think I know which side reality is on. Yes, I think you're right there as well. Well, that was really fascinating because I did not know anything about that at all. And, in fact, we've got a bit of a history of Buckley's in our, in our party as well. Um, so thanks very much for that, John. I also no do see we've got um, John Humphreys, our national president, from overseas, he's actually in our chat box right now, so everyone can get in there and um, ask questions of John as well. Um, now, of course, we are going to go to our interview with Spike Cohen, um, and that goes that does go for a little while, so you can sit back and relax and listen to Spike and David Limbrick talking away. We have an awesome guest tonight for Liberty Chat. 
It is Australia Day here in Australia, and we've got an American guest. What's going on? This is a bit strange. <laughs> um, Spike Cohen, many of you will know Spike's name. He is part of the Libertarian Party in the US, was running mates with Joe Jorgensen a couple of years ago for their election campaign. Started out as a running mate with Vermin Supreme, and man, I think the Free Ponies was a, a great uh, campaign <laughs> strategy. I think we should try that over here. Um, Spike, welcome to Australia, and welcome to Liberty Chat. Thank Great you. Thank you for having me. Happy Australia Day. And yeah, the free ponies thing definitely got the got my foot in the door <laughs> and, and I went from there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we just wanted to have a little uh, kind of a discussion, I guess, about your um, election campaign that, that for that run, because we, of course, are going through our federal election campaign. And David is running now as a federal senator. So this is a really big moment for our party as well. And I just sort of wanted to hear a little bit about your experiences and as a libertarian, how that how that sort of campaign plays out. Absolutely. So one interesting thing about our campaign was that it was the first time that the Libertarian Party actually ran a nationwide campaign. We had had other uh, national uh, presidential campaigns where we were on the ballot in all 50 states, but we didn't necessarily have an actual presence in all 50 states. Uh, Joe and I, between the two of us, visited, I believe, either 48 or 49 of the 50 states. Wow. Uh, two of them, one we couldn't visit because it was so remote, and the other one we couldn't visit because they had a, a, a quarantine program in place during that time. Mm -hmm. I myself visited something like 35 states across the entire country. Um, and one thing that I noted during all of that was that there was this odd dichotomy uh, in, the, uh, in the American uh, voting public. And I, and I think this is probably true in most of the developed world. Most people don't actually realize that freedom is important. Mm. But at the same time, they are acutely aware of what is happening to them and the harm that's being done to them as a result of their freedoms being restricted, even if they're not making that connection as to why that's what's happening. So for example, when we were campaigning, mostly through the summer and uh, in early fall of 2020 across the country, that was during the height of the lockdowns and the mandates that were happening in our country during that time. And we saw entire cities that had shut down, people who had lost everything, uh, people whose lives were being ruined, who had spent years building up their career, or their small business, only to be told that they had to stay home indefinitely. And they, we saw the, the acute harm that was being done across the board uh, and the total destruction to the middle class. And yet there was still a great disconnect from people not realizing that this was happening as a result of a violation of their rights. It wasn't just that government had done something wrong. It was that government didn't respect their autonomy and didn't respect their rights. And so we spent a lot of time in that campaign trying to thread that needle and show people in a relatively short period of time, because due to when we pick our nominee and then when the election is, we really only are being given about five months to make our case to the whole country. But during that time, to thread that needle and to make that case, and, and it was something I've continued to do after the election, that your freedom is not just a luxury. It isn't just something that makes you feel good that you can do things. Your freedom is inherently tied to your life and your livelihood. And at any point when it's being aggressed upon, especially when it's being aggressed upon by policymakers and people in power, it inherently is going to harm your livelihood. Mm -hmm. And by making that case that this isn't just about freedom, but about the prosperity that we have from freedom, that the health that, that we, we get from freedom, the better education and so forth that we get from freedom, and in contrast, the worst outcomes that we get from a lack of freedom, mm. that I believe is the way forward for the liberty movement. Mm. I, I find that resonates um, so closely to our experience in Australia as well. Like um, I've said for a long time that the people who appreciate freedom and you know, liberty the most are the people who've lost it to some degree. Yep. Exactly. And I think in many Western countries, we've sort of taken it for granted in lots of ways because, you know, it hasn't really uh, encroached on our life that much. But, you know, I've always said, you know, if you speak to like, you know, in, in my area that I represent in Southeast Metro, there's lots of people who are refugees. They've fled authoritarian regimes. These people really get it. And yep. but now and I think this is maybe the the silver lining of what's happened during COVID is that there's a lot of people looking around and saying, well, actually, um, liberty is actually really important. And I didn't like it when it was taken away from me. And who's and they're looking around and saying, who's defending it? And I think that's had a lot to do with the um, 
explosion in our growth in Australia over the last couple of years. And, and a lot of people just looking around and saying, who's defending my liberty here? Because I can feel it. It's hurting me. Mm. Anytime that the silver lining of any time that you see a mass acute effect of people's liberty being taken away, the silver lining there is obviously that we're able to make gains, provided that we make the case, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. I think there have been times in the past, not, I, I'm not going to necessarily say in Australia, but certainly in the States where we assumed that people would make that connection and then find us. And the reality is when the entire um, mainstream political conversation doesn't include actual liberty, maybe that, that catchphrase liberty or freedom, but not the actual reality of liberty and freedom, we can't expect people to just come to that conclusion. Even if the spark is there, like you said, David, we need to then make that case to them and say, see, here's what the problem is. This is, you know, they violated your autonomy. They assume that they could plan this out better than we could working together and look what they've done. And that's why it's so important what you're doing uh, in Victoria State and in your run for federal office. It's so important what the, the liberal Democrats are doing there in Australia, because you have to make that case. And when you make that case, the facts are on our side. But when, and when we make that case, bring people come in and they come to liberty. Mm -hmm. Well, we've certainly been running, well, this at the moment, our, our campaign is the biggest we've ever run. We're having trying to get basically uh, candidates in every district across the country. So it's a really big one for us. And, and what I've always said, and, and what you were sort of saying as well, Spike, is that our party itself has been around for 20 years. And we've been talking about freedom and liberty for 20 years. And only 2% of the population really paid much attention. But over the last couple of years, that silver lining has been people have now realised well, we're not that free. They can governments can close our business. They can close the schools. They can lock you in your home. And now people are seeing it, and it's excellent that we've got candidates like David stepping up again, and he's uh, created a huge following and actually opened up the eyes of a lot of people, which has been great. That's incredible. Mm. David, uh, yeah. did you have any more questions? Like I know that we were talking about, like obviously comparing the American election with the Australian election. Can you perhaps explain to Spike and also to some of our viewers, like the difference in how the Australian elections work? Yeah, well, I mean, maybe Spike can um, uh, fill us in a bit later on like what happened during that, um, during your presidential campaign. But like in, in Australia, we have, um, you know, similar, we have an upper house and a lower house, so a Senate and a house of representatives federally. And the way that it works, and I think this is probably a bit different in the US, is that each state in Australia has uh, 12 senators and they're um, at each election, half of those senators uh, finish their term and they're re-elected. So in Victoria, we're going to have six uh, new senators elected and there, there'll be a number of parties and they're elected through a preferential voting system. So, you know, you can choose one Liberal Democrats, two Liberal Party three, whatever you want to choose. Right, um, right. But the way that it works is, is that, you know, if you put a minor party uh, high up, like, like the Liberal Democrats, high up the ticket, but you still prefer one or the other of the major parties, you're not sort of uh, wasting your vote, which throwing, is- what, Throwing which your is vote a, away, yeah. Which I know in the US is a big, um, it's a big barrier yes. for the success of the Libertarian Party is, you know, people might, like your party and want to want to vote for it, but they're scared that it might, um, you know, enable another party that they don't like to to grab power um, because of the voting system in Australia. That that doesn't happen. In that, you know, you can rank them, and <clears throat> if you prefer the Liberal Party or the Labor Party or whatever, you just put them higher on the list. And if the candidate that you put as your first preference doesn't get elected, then you know your vote will go to one and it won't get wasted. So I actually think it's a really, really good um, system in Australia. And I'm very thankful that we, you know, initially opted for that when we set all this up in our constitution. So that, that's something oh, very good. Absolutely. First of all, first and foremost, it allows voters to have as many options as possible. If they only like one party or one candidate, great. They can vote for that one party or one candidate. But if they say, you know what? I like David the most. I like the, the Lib Dems the most. Uh, but next, uh, I like this party or this candidate. I like this party third or however they want to do it. It gives them that option. 
for us, what it does is it destroys what in this country anyway, in the US is the most powerful narrative they have against us. Well, you can't win. And if you're or, or you're less likely to win. And if I vote for you, then the lesser evil party could lose to the worser evil party, which then puts us in the position of having to show them how this, you know, lesser evil, worser evil thing is really just a good cop, bad cop routine that's never going to end. And that, you know, throwing your vote away is voting for the people who created the mess that we're in. Instead, if we had that kind of a system, that wouldn't even be anything that they could say to us. And then they'd actually have to debate our ideas <laughs> instead of just <coughs> pushing us away and saying, oh, well, you know, you're not likely to win and I can't let this party beat this party. They'd actually have to engage with us on our ideas and people who look at us and say, yeah, you know what, I, I, I think that you're we might even get people who say, you know what, I like this party better than you, but you're my second pick. That's fine as well. I think there are many people that would pick us first and knowing that they could vote for that lesser evil party as their second pick um, would definitely help us. And it's it's clearly helping y'all. I, I think that it's um, the only people it hurts are those who are entrenched in political power. I'm okay with that trade-off. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, one of the um, tactics of supporters of the major parties here is actually misleading Australians into thinking that you know, voting for a minor party here is wasting your vote. Like you, you hear it a lot when you talk mm -hmm. to people, you know, oh, I don't want to vote, vote for a minor party because I'm wasting your vote. I'm like, but we've, we're lucky enough to have a system where that isn't the case. Um, right. Yeah, so mm. um, it's it's sort of misinformation in a way, when, you know, when it's they talk lie. about yep. that. Here. Yep. Mm. Yeah. What would you say, Spike, um, during that campaign, for example, what was one of the most impactful moments for you, like when you're like talking with the crowd or what would you think really stood out from that campaign in particular for you? You know, I, it, I often people often think that it was like some moment, like in a big crowd thing. Mm -hmm. The things that stuck with me the most were when I was having one on one conversations with people about ideas or things that happened that I knew were happening in the abstract, but had never actually met someone who was directly affected by it. A lot of the folks who came out to my events uh, were people that were victims, for example, of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And they would tell me about how, you know, they once had a normal life and then they ended up with, uh, you know, a very severe injury that ended up getting them addicted to pain pills. And because the other safer options for dealing with chronic pain were illegal, they were forced to use opioids until the government cut them off of their legal supply. So now they had to get it illegally. And then they ended up turning to heroin and then they ended up in prison. And now they have a criminal record and they can't vote. In it. And I, I, hearing all of these things mm. and then talking to people who often, because of being criminalized, could not give me their vote because they can't in their state or in their area, they aren't allowed to vote. Um, and I would tell them, you know, listen, even if you're not able to vote for me, it's important that your story is told and it's important that we represent you because you have every bit as much of the rights as the people around you who are still legally allowed to vote. And I think in those kinds of moments, talking with people and seeing them have just a small spark of hope, um, that was probably the most impactful thing uh, of, of all, uh, especially in the aggregate, you know, putting them all together. Um, but even any of those individual moments in my mind was often much more powerful than some big moment that would happen, me speaking to a crowd of hundreds or, or thousands of people. Um, I think that it was actually much more impactful having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people whose lives were being ruined by bad policies that were often created by people that aren't even alive anymore. And just letting them know that there were people out there, an entire party, an entire movement that was dedicated to righting that wrong and helping them get their life put back together so that they're no longer being affected by that. That to me was probably the most impactful thing out of all of it. That's, that's really interesting that you mentioned about the, <clears throat> your experience talking to someone who's had problems, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with the war on drugs. I mean, we, we look at, um, America from afar and the problems that you've got with the opioid crisis in America. And uh, fortunately, for some reason, it hasn't really been a big thing in Australia. Um, lots of people were worried that it was going to turn into, you know, a similar sort of situation in Australia, but it sort of re hasn't really. Um, we do have problems with, with other drugs, but um, <clears throat> we, I'm not sure like what it's like in, in, in the U S uh, but 
in many cases here, they're trying to look, we're, we're trying to work towards at least, you know, decriminalization of possession for small amounts yeah. for people. So they don't get a criminal record, like you say. Um, they do have things here, like in Melbourne, they have like injecting centers where people can safely go and have drugs yeah. um, as a harm minimization thing. Mm -hmm. um, is it really still as like hardcore zero tolerance war on drugs in the US or is it is it sort of changing a bit? It is it is slowly moving towards decriminalization, but it is painfully slow and it it is also wildly different from state to state and area to area. Yeah. For example, uh, <laughs> the state of Oregon has essentially decriminalized possession of all drugs. Um, right. Contrast that with my state, South Carolina, where they still treat small possession of marijuana the same that they would treat possession of heroin. Uh, yeah, they right. have it scheduled exactly the same. So it really is a mixed bag. A drug that would, uh, you know, potentially you could get covered by your insurance in one state uh, will get you put in prison for many years in another. Uh, and in some cases, even differences from county to county within a state. Um, so it really is a mixed bag. Generally speaking, I am seeing even in the the circles that were typically the most pro war on drugs, which were typically the more right wing circles, even there, they're starting to realize this is a bad way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I think a big change has been, I think for a long time, the pro legalization community typically was also a pro whatever that drug is community. So for yeah. example, a lot of the people that were pro uh, legalization of marijuana would also talk about the good and medicinal uses and the the how it's a uh, a safer recreational drug than for example alcohol and things like that well you can't do that with meth or heroin <laughs> like there really isn't a powerful pro heroin lobby right <laughs> but the shift has been towards saying and and I, i've tried to lead by example on this uh like i told you before we got started i've been sober for 16 years uh, i don't even drink coffee i don't think drugs are good but I recognize that the prohibition on drugs has created a black market. It has empowered cartels. It has corrupted governments and police departments. It has criminalized what is a health problem and treated it like a criminal problem instead of a health problem. It has led to the militarization of our police departments. It has led to uh, this growing surveillance state. It has led to things like no knock raids, which in my state is coupled with castle doctrine, which means that it creates this legal fiction whereby the police can legally break into my home and I can legally shoot them. This kind of nonsense that is created by what is essentially an attempt to stop people from consuming a product. And it's not to say heroin's good, we should have everyone doing heroin. It's to say we can't deal with the heroin problem by empowering the people who have a vested interest in getting people to use heroin. We yes. do it by treating it like what it is, which is a health problem and to stop prohibiting it and instead to get people the help they need the same way we do with alcohol the same way we do with people who overeat the same way we do with people who you know live sedentary lifestyles or who smoke cigarettes treating it as a health problem instead of a criminal problem and as we have done that i've seen a serious shift in the u.s but it's going to take a long time there's some very there is both a strongly vested public opinion again in favor of the war on drugs and at multiple uh complex uh cottage industries built around the continuation of the war on drugs that we have to combat so but we're getting there we are getting there but you touched on a really really core issue that um i think is core at like explaining our our message like the pro liberty message in that um my personal views and the views of what the laws should be don't have to be the same. Like um, exactly. there seems to be a large number of people who think that if if I don't like something, that it should be illegal. Or if I like something, it should be mandatory or free. Right. And I think um, what you've done in your own personal example that you've you've generously shared, you say, I, you know, I personally, you know, I don't like drugs. You know, I've been sober for 16 years, uh, but I don't want them criminalized. I, I want to help these people. I want to talk yes. to them. I don't, I don't want to put them in jail, exactly. for example, right? I think this is a very key thing. Like, And um, I, I've had some success in ex explaining this to people. I'm saying it's okay for you to go out and lobby against X, Y, and Z and try and convince people that, you know, for example, you know, drugs are bad or whatever it is is bad. Yep. And libertarians yep. should have no problem with that, right? It, it, the problem is when you start 
trying to influence the laws and the legal system, then you've got problems because then you're, you're using force against people to enforce your will on the rest of the population, whether it be pro or anti something. Exactly. And in doing so, when you create that prohibition or that heavy restriction, you're creating a black market. You're yes. opening up, you, are, you are, are, are cornering a market for people who don't care what the law is. Yes. And not only don't they care what the law is, they don't care about people's lives. They no. don't care about people's personal property or their livelihoods. These are the, the criminals, the violent thugs. And you have government saying, hey, violent thugs, here's a market just for you, but you better not bribe us to look the other way. That would be terrible. Mm. And then we wonder why this happens. And you know, one thing that we benefit from in the US is that we had, some, we had a war on alcohol uh, about a hundred years ago, actually, alcohol yeah. prohibition. And it is universally, universally understood within the U.S. political mainstream that that was an utter failure because it empowered cartels and corrupted governments and criminalized the health problem and da 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 da. Now, for some reason, there are people who will look at you and say, "Yes, you can't legislate morality. That's why alcohol prohibition was failed." And then they'll explain why you know weed or or heroin or cocaine should be illegal. It's important then that we not just in the issue of drugs, but holistically on all issues that we make the case that even if something is bad, if it is not directly violating someone else's life or their rights or their property uh, or their livelihood, if you're not directly infringing on someone else and you are giving policymakers an opportunity to ban or greatly restrict this thing, you don't end that thing. I mean, mm -hmm. the opioid crisis shows us opioids didn't go away. Uh, uh, overdoses from opioids are at or above all time highs. It didn't make the problem go away. What it did was it put the domain for that problem in the hands of criminals and cartels and corrupt government officials. The last people we would want to handle this are the exclusively the only people that are allowed to handle this. Mm -hmm. And when we make that case consistently on drugs, on migration, on guns, I know that's a big issue in Australia, on public safety, on public health, when we are consistently saying that you cannot mandate the right thing because it makes everything worse, and when then we can show historically and in the present how that plays out, that's a powerful way for us to show people that liberty is the way forward. I, I, it's interesting that you mentioned the comparison between um, alcohol prohibition in the US and the war on drugs. I actually spoke about that exact topic on in my inaugural speech in parliament, talk about mm. how stupid prohibition was and how... You know, it's universally accepted, like you say, that it, yes. that it, um, that it, you know, increased corruption, it increased organized crime and violence. It also resulted in something else, which we see now in Australia, and I'm guessing uh, is a big problem in the US, adulterated products in the market yes. was a big, my mm -hmm. understanding is that there was a big problem with adulterated alcohol uh, and people were dying from it because it was poisoned basically with mm -hmm. methanol yep. and stuff. And the yep. other thing that happened during prohibition, which was really interesting, is the low strength alcohols disappeared from the market almost like no one no one wanted beer anymore right because no one wanted to smuggle it because it's too big and everyone went straight to whiskey and all these hard liquors yeah. um you see exactly the same thing with the war on drugs as well exactly mm -hmm. if you're going to catch the same time why not smuggle fentanyl instead of cannabis right like if you're if you're risking the roughly the same amount of time and you can make exponentially more money selling uh you know synthetic fentanyl or something like that who you know and and you already have established that you don't care about anyone's life or i mean you're you're a violent cartel member who you know regularly engages in in uh you know acts of violence against people for fighting over turf what makes you think they wouldn't do that and that that's exactly mm. what happens you're 100 correct Hmm. Now, and Spike, going back to uh, what you mentioned before, public health, uh, you may have seen some media about Australia over the, our, yes. our COVID response over the last year or two. What, I mean, yeah, we're living it, man. What, what are you seeing? Over there? What are your thoughts? Excuse me. My first thought when I saw what was coming out of Australia is I need to vet this because this can't possibly be happening. <laughs> Like that was my initially my first response because there's a lot of misinformation out there, right? Like there's yeah. a lot of stuff out there that turns out to be bogus. And when I first heard about these quarantine camps and all of a sudden, like there's no way that Australia has gone from zero to camp this quickly. And I looked and no, sure enough, they got the camps. And then I would talk about the camps and Australian Twitter would come 
onto my, onto my, especially on Twitter, uh, would come on. And about half of them would explain why it was okay. And that this was perfectly, you know, oh, I guess you want us to be like you, you know, you, you Americans, you Yanks, you know, dying left and right from COVID. Uh, and I'm thinking, mm, you know, you guys are in camps. <laughs> like, I, 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 I feel like, I, if I have to choose between, and again, I, I'm I'm recovering from COVID right now. I take COVID very seriously. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I do not recommend anyone go out and get COVID, okay? But if I have to choose between a very serious illness that is uh, many times more dangerous uh, than the flu, or still having to deal with that illness, but maybe slightly less, but also people are being put in camps on a regular basis, I'm going to choose what we're going through right now. Uh, that's, that's not even a, an easy thing. The most interesting thing that I have seen most recently is that, uh, as I understand it, there has been some relaxation of some of the restrictions now that uh, all of the states and territories have met the, the arbitrary thresholds for vaccination. And the reaction from not just the Australian media, but much of the, at least the English speaking foreign media, including American media, to the fact that most or all of the states are holding firm to having not even no restriction, but less restriction, despite the uh, onslaught of the Omicron variant. Even as they recognize that Omicron proves that COVID's not going away. Even as they recognize that Omicron is by far not going to be the last variant, that there mm -hmm. will continue to be more variants, that, you know, you're either going to have to choose between continued booster vaccination or just recognizing the vaccine's not going to work. Even in the midst of all of that, they're still, and even in the midst of recognizing that the very second that you guys let down even remotely on the restrictions, you had a full onslaught of Omicron, just like everywhere else, yeah. they're still calling for those restrictions. And what that tells me is that they're no longer saying this is a temporary thing and we just got to keep our nose to the grindstone until things get better. They recognize that this is something that would not go away and they want that. They mm. want this to be normal. They want regular putting innocent people in camps because of close contact exposure, not even having COVID, but possibly having COVID. Yes. They want that to be something that never ends. And it just drives home, you know, when I when I hear the success that you've had, David, and that the, the liberal Democrats have had, by the way, do you guys call yourself Lib Dems there? I, I know that, the, oh, okay, yeah. I, I, I said it and then I thought, I don't know, make sure that they no, Lib Dems is our that. sort of colloquial. Yeah. I thought right. you were spot on no. getting that. I'm like, well, that's good. He's done his research. <laughs> well, I've heard it in other countries, but then I'm like, yeah. well, wait, those are left-wing parties in those countries. Maybe yes. they don't want to be called. We're, we're quite but, okay, so the UK version. Okay, good. Well, that's, I'm <laughs> happy to hear that. Um, but, but the success that the Lib Dems are having, it's not just important for our ideas of, of freedom and of liberty. You're fighting for the, the soul of Australia. You're fighting for the ability of Australian people to have even a semblance of freedom in your country. Um, and, you know, it's the same thing that we're fighting for over here. But no, to answer your question, I, I, I was actually skeptical that the things that I was being told were happening there were happening. And then to find out that not only was it indeed happening, but that a sizable per percentage of the population had been so frightened and conditioned into thinking yes. that this was what needed to be done, that they were all for it. And they were explaining why this, these gilded cages were great. And that was scary. One of the parallels that I've drawn, and this is one of the things that worries me, like, you know, yes, we're opening up and, and removing some of our restrictions now, but how many of these things are going to end up permanent? Because one of the things that actually got me interested in the pro-liberty movement in the first place was the aftermath of 9-11 attacks and the war on yes, terror yes. and all that sort of stuff, right? And what I saw at the time was, yes, there was an acute phase, but then afterwards, all these things hung around and they're still yes. around, right? Like oh, we've, yeah. got, we've got these surveillance acts and all these anti-terror laws in Australia. I know the US has got all, this, all the same sort of things, right? They're oh, still yeah. around like 20 years mm -hmm. later, more than 20 years later. And I'm worried that we're gonna have the same sort of thing with the pandemic where we have this acute phase and, you know, everyone's panicking and stuff and then, <coughs> then it goes yep. away, but then there's all these things that hang around that um, take our liberty, like, you know, like QR codes, like you've got to scan a code before you go into a shop. And the initial uh, rationale for that was to contact trace and stuff. And that sort of makes sense to most people, but then like all these things, they expanded the scope on it. They said, all right, well, now we're going to use it to check whether you're vaccinated or not. And if you're not vaccinated, you're not going to be able to go into certain stores and this sort of thing. And 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 so I'm just like, you know, how long are we going to, like, what's the conditions under which these QR codes are going to disappear, right? Because we haven't been given 
you know, what's the plan? What's the exit strategy here? Because it's not clear. And whenever you ask about it, they say, oh, we'll just follow the, we'll just follow the expert advice and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. but Science. Yeah. There's no yeah. clear, there's no clear. Two weeks to flatten the curve, remember? Yeah, there's no clear exit strategy on this stuff. I want to know when, when are the QR codes going? Under what conditions will they disappear? And no one will answer that. I don't think, I, and, and this may be different in Australia, in the parts of the US where they've introduced things like vaccine mandates and passports and things like that, they haven't even indicated there is an exit strategy. Mm, They'll say no. something vague like, until the pandemic's over. Well, we know the yeah. pandemic's not going to be over. In fact, yeah. it's not even a pandemic anymore. We are solidly in an endemic phase. We frankly, we've been in an endemic state phase since the second or third variant came out back in the beginning of 2021. The reality is this thing has not is not going away. The things that we would get banned from social media for saying, like, for example, COVID's not going away. The vaccines aren't going to stop COVID from spreading. There are going to be more variants that get easier to transmit and hopefully uh, less deadly over time, which does seem to be what's happening. All of that combined uh, and the fact that they're saying, if they even say that there's an exit, it's, well, when the pandemic's over, tells me that it's the same as when they said, well, we'll stop doing all these restrictions once we've fought terrorism successfully. <laughs> Terrorism's yeah. not going away, right? Once so all the like, terrorists I'm, are gone. Yeah. <laughs> once all the terrorists are gone, while the CIA is also like continuing to sponsor <laughs> terrorism around the world, yes. you know, but, you know, just in case it might accidentally go away, um, you know, we're still taking our shoes off at airports. Mm. And I actually pay, uh, 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 what is it, $85 every few years for a special pre-clearance system where I get to keep my shoes on and, uh, and not go through an x-ray machine every time I, I board an airplane uh, because of something that happened 11 years ago, which it's not even clear that this system would have stopped the shoe bomber, but yet we're still doing it. And it's just, I, I am concerned, David, for, for the residual that will happen. And it's why we can't rest on our laurels. We no. can't simply say, as has happened in the liberty movement in the past, uh, in the US at least, where we would say, well, once people realize you know, what's happening to them, they'll fight back. Not necessarily. No. We need to lead the charge and lead by example and show what fighting for freedom is. Fighting for freedom isn't just what the two parties pretend to do, where this party does this much and then this party bravely fights for it to go back to only this much. No, we're fighting to get rid of all of it. We're fighting to get rid of all of the tyranny and all of the oppression. And when we're the ones leading the way on that, we're the ones bringing people into a true liberty movement, we have the wherewithal and the ability to do that. That's why I'm so excited to see what y'all are doing there in Australia. Oh, well, that is a great way to sort of wrap this up, Spike. But before we finish up, uh, we always, we've been chatting recently about um, people's favourite books to read, for example, about liberty and freedom. What would you say is your number one libertarian must read? Oh, man. So the thing is, because most people that are into liberty are already reading the libertarian reads that I'd recommend, like, you know, yep. policy and ph philosophy and praxis stuff, you know, Rothbard and, and Hazlitt and, and Mises and so forth. The one I recommend is How to Win Friends and Influence People by <laughs> Dale Carnegie. That's a classic, okay? yeah. Because the thing with libertarians is we've already got the ideas, right? You don't, most libertarians don't have to be here long to really get the ideas down. Mm -hmm. Our problem is explaining it to the normies. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you know, I think we often fool ourselves into thinking that if we just present the perfectly rational argument that all the people out there will look at our argument and say, my God, look <laughs> at how logical this argument is. There's not a single way that I could rebut this without engaging in some kind of logical fallacy. And I'd certainly never do such a thing. I'm a libertarian now. And that's not how it works. <laughs> you have to reach people in their concerns, in their emotions. You have to meet people where they are. And for those who don't know, Dale Carnegie wrote uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People during the height of the depression uh, mm -hmm. and talking to people about if you want to build wealth and influence, you have to look past just working for someone else or look past the old so-called tried and true methods. You have to create networks. And those networks have to be networks of people who are excited to be a part of anything that you're a part of. They want to be influenced by you. They want to be inspired and led by you. Mm -hmm. And the, the techniques that are taught in that book 
are, are really can be applied to everything. They can be applied to your political activism. They can be applied to your professional career. They can be applied to your relationships, your interpersonal relationships. There's really no limitation on it. Uh, so if you ever find yourself saying, man, I wish I could get people to agree with me more easily, I would definitely recommend How to Win Friends and Influence Other People by, uh, by Dale Carnegie. That is brilliant advice because it, yeah, it's, there's so many similarities, of course, in the liberty movement between the US and Australia. And, and that's just what I'm, so. yeah. that's why I was laughing. Um, try not to laugh too much, I suppose. Now, Spike, obviously you're on several podcasts, Muddy, Muddy Waters and what have you. You're brilliant on Facebook. How can people follow you and, and, and continue with your, particularly your amazing Facebook game? Yes, if you would like to watch me bully federal agencies, not just U.S. federal agencies, I've gone after the Australians a couple of times. Come months, after so, us, we um, deserve it. I, I, I come after, I, I am uh, uh, equal opportunity in bashing government agencies and media <laughs> outlets around the world. Uh, and if you'd like to follow me in doing so, uh, I am on Facebook, I am on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok for the kids. Oh. And, uh, uh, and I'm very easy to find if you just look for Spike Cohen. Uh, you will find me. Uh, my website is spikecohen.com. Uh, you can follow me there for any events that I'm doing. I hope to be able to be allowed back into your fine country one day uh, as soon as they allowed us, us dirty, unvaccinated people back in your country. <laughs> um, but uh, in the meantime, you can follow me there. Uh, I do my shows uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings, mm -hmm. uh, Eastern time. So I guess mornings, your time, yeah. uh, Wednesday mornings and, and Thursday mornings, your time on Muddied Waters Media. That is on all podcasting platforms that is on all social media platforms and on muddywatersmedia.com and uh, Kirsty and David I just really appreciate your time I appreciate everything you're doing there in Australia David I wish you the best in your race I think what you're doing already in Victoria State and what you plan to do in the in, in federal office I'm all 100% behind it. We, it it is folks like you who are the spear's edge of fighting for liberty here and around the globe and I I couldn't be more proud to see you doing it 100%. Thank you so much for your generous words. And thank you so much for speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much, Spike. Well, that was great. I It was for me, it was just a joy watching it the second time round as well. I was still laughing at, at some of it. Uh, and there were some wonderful comments in the chat box as well. John, what were your thoughts on Spike? Well, yeah, look, I absolutely loved it. And I, I tell you, I loved his background. That was the coolest. Oh, yeah, group. he was in space, yeah. That was the coolest Zoom background I've ever seen. <laughs> I was so thrilled to hear that he said um, about Dale Carnegie's book as a great book because, you know, I would have been yeah. too embarrassed to say that, but now that he <laughs> said it, because it is a great book, it's extremely simple. And, uh, but look, I look, I thought, I thought what he was saying about comparing the war on drugs to the prohibition in the 1920s uh, was, you know, absolutely, you know, it's a perfect parallel. And, and, you know, Prohibition was so, so popular there when they brought it in, because it's very hard to amend the Constitution in the United States. They actually, that was a constitutional amendment to ban alcohol. Okay, but then it, 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 it turned into such a mess, gave us Al Capone and all these gangsters and everything. And then they had to have a constitutional amendment to, to, to get rid of it, which is also hard, but they were able to do that because within about 12 years, it was proven to be such a mess. So, uh, hmm. look, he's a very articulate guy. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, pleased to hear he's uh, un unvaxxed, but hopefully he can come to Australia soon. That's right. And he was just recovering from COVID. He did just have COVID recently. So that's why he did cough a little bit in there. Um, and Rob Cribb is in the chat box giving me a hard time because he knows how much I love Spike. Yes, I'm a bit of a Spike fan. And he's joking about me putting it in all caps, which I did in the email because I was just so excited. Uh, so there you go, Rob Cribb. I've made it my mission that we must mention Rob Cribb in every episode as well, John. So, you know, feel free to drop in a crib uh, every week. Um, <laughs> now, I wanted to just quickly, before we get into the Freedom Manifesto video, of which you're a star of, I just wanted to go through some of the other events that are coming up around the country as well, because there are a lot of branch events and campaign events going on. I'm just going to rattle off a couple of them. And obviously, if anyone wants to uh, find out more, if you're in that area, you probably have already had an email, but otherwise you can certainly get on the website and message or email me at contact at ldb.org.au. Um, Adelaide has got their first ever Freedom Barbecue on February 13. And of course, they do have their State Council and AGM on the 5th of Feb. And that has um, a recorded interview with Dr. Ron Paul, which is also very amazing as well. Uh, and also David Linehelm. 
there is, as we mentioned earlier, the Riverina Rebellion in Wagga on February the 16th, the day after the court case about our name. Tamworth in February 8th, there's another event in Dubbo, I think a week after that. There's a West Melbourne barbecue on February 5th, the same day as the Yarra Valley here in Victoria. There's also the Liberty Book Club online. Um, you can email me for more information about that. The Gold Coast, the 13th of February. Uh, Geelong is actually this weekend, January 13. There's also a, um, a trip this weekend with Crystal, uh, Crystal Mitchell and Carolyn White, our number two and number three Senate candidates here in Victoria. They're going to Torquay on Friday, Mortlake and then Warrnambool. So there's events all the way along. We've got a brand new branch opening in Mortlake and also a new candidate down there in Warrnambool for the district of Wannan. The big one for Queensland is the campaign launch and awards night, which is at the Pullman Hotel on the 11th of February. That's a really big one. So please get in touch about that one. Uh, and there's also various candidate events going on, Nick Samios, in Barawa is having his weekly barbecues. Victor Tay's doing his things all the time. Paul Barker down here in Geelong is having his, his barbecues every week as well. Some people are putting up some of those other dates in the chat box which as well, which is great. But some of those events are on the website. But if you want more information, please just email in at contact at LDP. John, anything else you want to wrap up before we play this video? Um, well, um, look, I, look, let's play I, it and see what we think. Let, let's, let's get straight into it, Kirsty, yes. <laughs> so number two from the Freedom Manifesto is Recall Elections, and this one is starring Mr John Ruddick, our lead Senate candidate for New South Wales. Imagine going out on a second date with somebody and realising they were an absolute psycho, but you weren't allowed to break up with them for four years. You just had to put up with them as they ruined your life. Recall elections enables you to break up with bad politicians who are obviously not right for you. In only two years, we transformed from one of the most free and prosperous nations in the world into a place where you can't leave your home without express permission, a mask and a tracking device on your phone. The Liberal Democrats will give you a way out. I'm John Ruddick and I'm the New South Wales Senate candidate for the Liberal Democrats. In this video, I want to talk about the second policy in our party's Freedom Manifesto, which we put under the heading Recall Elections. The response to COVID has demonstrated just how unaccountable governments can become between elections. What we're proposing is three things. Firstly, citizens must have the right to recall power mad politicians. If Scott Morrison were to block you from travelling or returning from overseas, you could get a petition signed by a certain threshold of people, trigger a by-election or a full general election for the entire government if we get sufficient signatures. So the second thing we want to do is enable the citizens veto on any legislation. No longer will citizens have to camp in front of Parliament House day and night or to protest with no guarantee that it will make any difference. Citizens should be able to veto legislation. Legislation does infringe our freedom. Obviously some legislation is good, but we want to give the citizens the power to trigger a referendum to remove legislation. And lastly, this policy will make voting voluntary. Some people are disinterested in politics, some people are apathetic, and some people who are interested in politics say, I don't like any of them at this election and I want to sit home. We've got to give people that freedom. What happens at the moment when we're all forced to vote, even the people that don't want to vote, it means that our politicians, knowing that their bases are going to vote, only focus on the apathetic middle. We need politicians that are going to appeal to their base, convince their base that, they, that they've got the right vision and convince the middle. That is the, the democratic ideal. Human history tells us that democracy is a good thing, and we, but we need to keep working on our democracy. We need to keep refining it because politicians will, and government will always find a way to take away our liberties. These three policies that the Liberal Democrats are fighting for at the next federal elections, recall elections, citizens veto over legislation and voluntary voting, these are three tangible steps, important steps, that will really put power back in the hands of the people. Please read about it further in the Liberal Democrats' Freedom Manifesto. Thank you. Authorised by John Humphreys for the Liberal Democratic Party, Mount Waverley, Victoria. That was great. 
there's a lot of a uh, lot of comments, a lot of very positive comments in there for you, John. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, look, I liked how that how that turned out. Yes, certainly has sort of brought home to me how much I have eaten since <laughs> the pre-Christmas period. So yes, the the John Ruddick uh, health health kick starts tomorrow. Excellent. Well, I'm just blaming it all on like lockdown for the last two years. That's what I'm blaming it on. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, when, when, when can we distribute that uh, on social media? That will be out on, on YouTube and Facebook within half an hour. Okay, fabulous. Great. I'll yeah, look forward so to definitely, it. So um, definitely everyone share it, like and share it, show all your friends. Hopefully your friends will at least watch a less than three minute video because it is an important one as well. Um, but yeah, lots of really great comments in here, John. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, um, good. Good. Uh, some uh, David asking, I'd be a bit interested to know how the mechanisms would work for the recall elections. That might be one that you would have to uh, email John about, David. So you can email John at john.ruddick at ldp.org.au. Um, uh, so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of great things in there. Oh, 15 minutes will be up, says Rob McCarthy. So there we go. Uh, Benjamin asks, are John Ruddick and Ross Cameron related? Their speaking style is so similar. Well, look, we uh, we have re we have both done uh, uh, DNA tests, and we're both overwhelmingly <laughs> Scottish. Oh, we may be we may be related. Yes. Well, there you go. Uh, Fiona asks, "What about the first ad? Where is that, Fiona? That is on our YouTube channel and also on our main Facebook page. Uh, so if you go to uh, the Liberal Democrats Australia on YouTube, you'll definitely see it there, and hopefully, someone very quickly will put it in the chat box now." Um, yeah, and people are just saying they're going to be sharing it. Let me just have a look at a few more of these questions. There's been a couple of little ones um, going on. Not There hasn't been a lot of questions in the chat box this time, I think because we had so much of the uh, uh, Spike interview, but there's been a lot of comments going on through here as well. But I think we are pretty much wrapped up for time. Um, 8.34, we've done pretty well to finish all of this in here. Uh, Nick Samios and Baroa has also just shared his barbecue details in the chat for anyone in that area in Sydney. Um, John, are you going to that one as well? Uh, well, this Saturday I'm with Victor Tay actually. Oh yes, yes, you've got it. Is Nick's Nick's is on Saturday morning, correct? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, uh, well, look, as a general rule, if I'm not doing anything, I like going to Nick Samios's barbecues on Saturday morning. So there you it's go. An opportunity to get to long, to get to get together. Yes. Oh, it's Friday night, this one. Oh, really? Okay, great. Okay. There well, you go. I'll, You'll I'll, be free. Yeah. I think uh, yes. there's so many barbecues going on at the moment. I think I'm at a barbecue every weekend and I quite like it. Who doesn't love a sausage sizzle? It saves me going to Bunnings and spending too much money. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining us again tonight. Thanks, Kate Fantanel, for being our guest. Thanks again, John Ruddick. And, yes, the edit for this will be out in the next couple of days and certainly our Spike video as well. Oh, there's another comment in here. David's having birthday drinks for Liberty Lovers in East Sydney this Sunday. Get in that chat box there. And we'll see you all next week. Terrific. Thanks, Kirsty. And uh, so happy to have Kate on board. Ah, oh, it's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Bye, Kate. <laughs> Good you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Liberty Chat, brought to you by the Liberal Democrats. Visit ldp.org.au for more info.